Hi, Emily. It is so nice to see you. So nice to see you. I have covered you for many, many years, usually about things that you're wearing, mm -hmm. sometimes in the beauty sector, but you have an amazing feat. You have just written a book, so congratulations. Tell me a little bit what that experience was like. It's been a long time in the process. I started writing essays sort of more for myself, kind of as a challenge in a way of organizing my thoughts. Eventually, I had enough essays that I was like, actually, this, this could be a book. Can we talk about the title a little bit, yeah. My Body? Well, all the essays are about kind of relationships or experiences I've had with my body, whether it be through modeling as like a commodity or as a young woman developing um, into, you know, a woman's figure when I was still very young. And I also liked the idea that, you know, when I came up with the title that it would be an all text cover. I think that so many people are used to seeing images of me and my body. Um, I liked the idea that just the words were kind of enough for the association and that people would bring their ideas about who I am or my image um, publicly to the book, and then we kind of shatter them. I mean, it's interesting that you do call it my body because there are several instances in the book where it's almost like you don't have ownership of your own body. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of nice to see that this title, text only, yeah. shows that you actually do have ownership. There's something to that for sure as well. So you mentioned that at a young age, people always spoke to you about how you looked and how your looks were valued, and there was a lot of focus on that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, how did that affect you as you were growing up? I mean, I think that, interestingly, all young women have that experience to a certain degree. I write about this in the book, being on the middle school playground, having the sense of the hierarchy of, like, the hot girls. You know, that was sort of the micro experience, but then on a larger level, having all these you know, seemingly very powerful women like Britney Spears or any pop stars who were sexually attractive and were um, were seemingly in control. So I think for me, I, it was sort of a weird experience because I had developed a female, like a woman's body when I was still a girl. I didn't even really know what sex was. And I had really mixed messages, getting very validating attention from boys at school and and appropriately adult men. Um, but then also at the same time feeling this like deep shame around it because you know um, I felt very different than my peers. Having boobs made teachers feel uncomfortable and there was you know um, dress codes and just experiences where I felt ashamed. Well, it's interesting. That is a theme that comes up throughout the book. There's times when it volleys between, you know, you have a lot of pride around the way that you look. Your mom is saying, take pride in how you look, mm. never be ashamed. And then there's a shame moment. And this happens again and again and again, where, you know, people tell you to cover up, you get yeah. sent home. Mm -hmm. So after all of these years of experiencing this sort of difference of emotion, where are you now? It sort of just continued to be the same thing. An idea that's really at the heart of the book is the double-edged sword of, you know, commodification of image and body and sexuality and objectification of self. I mean, I think that undeniably there's been so many ways that I have, you know, I built a platform. I'm talking to you right now. Uh, you know, if I was an unknown writer, I'm not sure that I would have the same capability to get these ideas out into the world. And that's come through fame, which has been, you know, through modeling. Um, and, you know, more specifically in my case, like really sexualizing myself and letting others sexualize me. I think it's really important to kind of name that there's just obvious power that can be, you know, achieved through that. What this book is trying to do is sort of show the complicated sides to it that, you know, for a very long time, I felt like being a hustler and knowing how to work the system as a woman um, was feminism and that it was my choice. And it's just more complicated than that. And I mean, speaking of feminism, we've seen you sort of grow up in front of the camera as yeah. a feminist. I remember back in 2017, because I covered this, <laughs> you walked out in a t-shirt that simply said, Feminist AF. Mm -hmm. I mean, the next year you were at the protest Brett Kavanaugh mm -hmm. with Amy Schumer where you got arrested. Yeah. And now you have a whole entire book that hinges on feminism. Yeah. So how have you seen yourself grow as a feminist? I'm more interested in asking questions around feminism than I used to be. I think that um, there was like a defiant kind of wanting to prove something before when people would ask me about my politics around feminism and being a woman. I felt very like 
fuck off. <laughs> um, like it's my choice and I can do what I want and that's feminism because I'm choosing. And kind of had ideas about what was empowering and what wasn't. And now I'm just more curious about kind of looking and asking questions and having conversations around power dynamics and women. I don't come with answers. Even though I've written this book, I feel like it's much more about kind of the posing questions around feminism. Is there like a certain experience that, you know, was a pivotal moment that made you, you know, question everything that you thought from before? I think it just came with getting older, starting to realize that, you know, having sort of what I had always wanted, even as a young person, I started modeling when I was 14 and, you know, all of a sudden shooting the things that I wanted to shoot and making a, a very good living off of this profession, that it didn't just feel like powerful. Um, and that I also had ideas about self-worth that um, weren't serving me. What sort of ideas can you expand? When I was growing up, the examples of powerful women that I looked at were always the most desirable women. Even when I went to you know college to, to become an artist and thought that there were all these other things that I wanted to do with my life, it sort of seemed to me like the ultimate way to succeed as a woman was to be desirable. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, in some ways that's been true. That idea of thinking that that's the only way to be a powerful woman, I've, ch I've changed my feelings on that. And I actually think that through writing this book is kind of the, the first time I've actually really felt empowered because I'm in control in a way that I never was before. In the book, you talk about your first boyfriend in high school, and you mentioned some things, and there's disturbing details involved, and I want to know how did that affect you and shape you? I mean, I think that when you're a young girl, you're sort of, you're new to obviously relationships, and I realized that, you know, a lot of kind of the way that that relationship in particular progressed, I was like 14 years old, um, was influenced by the way that I had learned girls should be with boys. Um, and that meant like never really being clear about what you want and don't want. Um, even like I think that in many ways I wasn't really like super interested in him. And um, I think that, you know, just even as somebody to spend time with. But for me, I had come into a new school and there was a part of me that just felt like I, I should kind of continue down this road. Um, and, you know, it was a relationship I had a lot of shame around, which was one of the reasons I wanted to write about it, because I was curious, like, this can't be so black and white, this can't just be my fault, um, kind of, you know, because I, I guess there's this sort of first love idea in our culture that seems so romanticized, and I always sort of felt bad about the fact that I, I didn't relate to that experience um, and that that hadn't that had been taken away from me in some ways but I felt like I had taken it away from myself time and time again in the book I mean mm -hmm. I know that is high school that you wrote about mm -hmm. but there are other situations where you say women align themselves with men and they also align themselves with powerful men and yeah. then they're rewarded from it because mm -hmm. your proximity to powerful men immediately elevates your status. Yes, like, and in that example, it was literally just being a new girl at a different mm -hmm. high school and being like, I wanna go to parties and make friends. Yeah. So I'll hang out <laughs> with this person, you know? Um, which I don't know if it's gendered so much, but I definitely think the ways that I kind of didn't make it clear what I wanted um, were very much gendered. Um, but yeah, that's like a small example of it that then played out in different ways into my adult life and into my career. So you talk a lot, obviously, about your body and your looks and all of these things and being judged upon those things, which are all mm -hmm. physical. And from that, you talk about not being taken seriously. Mm -hmm. There's several moments, you know, you might be at a casting and someone basically writes you off. And then there was a very personal moment that struck me was when you were at a party mm -hmm. and it was your husband's friend who mm -hmm. very vocally just wrote you off. Mm -hmm. And this is like, you know, as you were writing your book, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But on the other hand, people seem to be listening to you and taking you more seriously. So was there a specific moment 
that you really realized that people were listening to you? I think that unfortunately it's not like a switch that flips. I think that women in general who use their body and the way they look, which by the way, I think almost every woman does that no matter what profession they're in. And mm -hmm. sometimes that means like totally covering up and not wearing makeup, but they're considering how they're presenting themselves in the world as a woman to either be taken seriously or to succeed in one way or another. Um, it's a survival like response. The experience that I had that kind of was the best moment of people, quote unquote, listening to me was when I published one of the essays from the book, Buying Myself Back in New York Magazine. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I felt like people really um, were paying attention and, and understood the nuance and complexity and the things that I was trying to say. Whereas before, I'd never had a, a, a medium or a way to do that. Did a lot of women reach out to you after that essay was published and say that they had similar experiences or anything like that? I mean, obviously, I think this book, you know, I, I wrote it with other women in mind. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, the most important relationships in my life are with other close female friends and the way that we share the vulnerabilities of our experience, whether it be like going on a date with a guy and feeling like a power dynamic there or, you know, my experiences on set or as a public persona, it actually, they're interchangeable. They're all dealing with the same kind of reality um, of what it means to be a woman. And it was really amazing to see that it wasn't just models, it was just women in general who, you know, related to the experience of being really young and wanting to impress someone or wanting to have control or feeling powerful, but then also completely feeling like there's there's no control. And also it was really cool because I heard from a lot of men as well. Good, you're opening up their minds too, which That's is- That's the hope, nice. right? And I mean, speaking of, you know, men, you are a recent mother, mm -hmm. congratulations. Thank and you. And you have a baby boy. Yes. Who's very cute. Thank um, you. But I mean, that's also tough. I mean, you're raising, you're raising a kid, you're raising a boy. What yeah. do you hope that this book will teach him? What do you want to teach him? I mean, it's so hard because he's seven months old and right now I'm just wanting <laughs> to feel um, like loved and taken care of. And you know, when he is hungry that he knows that he's gonna be fed and all that. Um, I want boys to understand the experience of being a woman in the way that women understand the experience of being a man. But I do think that there's sort of this category, especially for the way men consume media, that feels like, oh, this is for women and this is for men. And I kind of, I'm hoping that this book kind of um, helps men understand what it's like to be a woman in our culture. Wait, what was the most difficult essay to write? The one that was the hardest for me was Blurred Lines um, mm -hmm. because I didn't want to write about that experience. Like everything in my kind of gut told me that, um, you know, the way that it did land in the media, like I knew that was gonna happen. And I felt like I was opening myself up for that in a way that I didn't want to. The Blurred Lines set was one of, um, the days of work at that point in my life that was really fun. I was really relaxed and I was surrounded by women and there were so many things about that set that were very enjoyable. I'm like scared to use the word empowered because I think it gets overused and I'm not sure if that's the right thing, um, but I definitely felt more in control and more cared for than I, I did on a lot of other sets where I was shooting with like, you know, creepy 36 year old men when I was 20. But yeah, there was this like, one moment where it felt very clear like what my position was on set um, and what the other women's position was on set, that this was, you know, his music video and I was hired to be there and I was replaceable, right? Like I could have, you know, they could have just said like, okay, she had an issue with him, which I think would have been what happened and there would have been someone else on set. And that's a micro example of a much larger power dynamic that I've experienced um, as a model, but also just as a woman in, in the world. And it sort of shows, you know, who has the power to make or break you yeah. in a sense, which yeah. is really sad, but it's reality. Yeah, and I think that's so contrary to what I wanted to believe at that point in my life, which was that, like, through, you know, using my body as model, I was, you know, finding success. I was making money, and money meant freedom, and um, I really wanted to believe that I was sort of the one in, in, in control, and I wasn't. Not totally. 
Yeah, it's like a constant tug of war. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Who are the feminists and the writers that influence you? There's the feminist writers and thinkers that have influenced me sort of from the beginning. And then there are the writers that kind of helped influence this book Mm -hmm. um, as far as the structure and essays. Um, Those are Lacey Johnson, The Reckonings is a book that I recommend, uh, essay collection, Gia Tolentino's Trick Mirror, Leslie Jameson, um, The Empathy Exams, Carmen Maria Machado's memoir, which is not a book of essays, but has a really unique structure called In the Dream House. And then feminist thinkers, I mean, I read a lot of bell hooks when I was Mm -hmm. writing this. Um, I just think her writing is so direct and like not flowery in a way that I really respect and she's totally willing to be vulnerable and sort of lace through her own experiences with her family and with men. Naomi Wolf, The Beauty Myth is something I read very young and um, I think that that was a huge influence. I mean, I could go on and on. Rebecca Solnit, huge influence. I I quote her at one point in the book. So after writing this book, Mm -hmm. is there a lesson that you want people to learn from it? I would never tell a young woman not to model um, because I've had so much success and so many amazing doors open. And I do think that, you know, there's a younger generation of women who understand this sort of um, idea of hustling the system as it is. I mean, OnlyFans is a great example of that. I think that, you know, the ways that women are interacting with the internet and trying to have ownership, I think there's nothing that I could teach those women. Mm -hmm. Like, they know what's going on. I just felt like as someone in the culture who represented something about empowerment and objectification, it was really important to write the whole story so that people, women in particular, who maybe will decide to model, understand the double-edged sword. Um, That's interesting to watch how every year and every essay, something tweaks a bit Mm -hmm. where you become someone different. You learn a little bit more about yourself. I think like one of the most beautiful and potentially like amazing things about life is that we can change and change the way we think about things. And I feel like in our culture right now, that's sort of like not, it's looked down on or it's sort of not accepted. I feel like there's this black and white thinking, you're either on this team or that team. um, And there isn't a lot of curiosity and just sort of um, room to kind of like question things and grow your political beliefs or just your ideas about life and family and yourself. So I want that to happen more. (laughs) I mean, I hope other people Take note too. Yeah. And I mean, it's life is a journey, is what they say. You just mm-hmm. learn as you go. I feel like some people are like, this is my kind of point of view, and that's it. And I don't know, in some ways, I wonder, like, maybe in 10 years, I'll reread this book and feel like, oh no, I actually have completely different ideas now. You know, my perspective's changed. We'll see. Well, Emily, it was such a pleasure speaking to you. This was a very interesting conversation. It was great. Lots of layers to Emrata. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.